Hello and welcome to another episode of Crossing the Line, Tales from the Entertainment Industry. And I'm your host, Oliver Rednell. And I'm your co-host, Charlie Collicutt. We were so happy to have actor Adam James on the podcast. And in this episode, we discussed Adam's journey as an actor, advice for people wishing to follow in his footsteps, and some truly brilliant stories, including how a choice filming location on BBC's Extras led to Adam believing he was going to be fired by Ricky Gervais. Please make sure to like, subscribe and share on whatever platforms you're listening to this podcast on. Otherwise, enjoy the episode. You've been working in the industry for an awfully long time. I think that's fair. All right, all right. All right. <laughs> all right. Why has you left the talk? Okay, right. <laughs> it's alarming, isn't it, how quickly the time goes? Yeah, it has, it's yeah, it's a good old 20-odd years or so. When would you I... say when people ask you, when did you start being an actor? Because people ask me this, and I'm like, well, I don't really know. Like, Is it when you start working? Is it before when you start working? Is it the day you good decide question, that you are an actor? Right. I think I fell into that beautiful stereotype of essentially being an only child and showing off and that getting a lot of attention and thought, well, this fucking works. So I'll try this for as long as possible. And I, so I sort of did, I just, and then I, you know, you did the school plays and that got a lot of attention. And, um, and there was a point actually at school uh, where I suppose there were, I was rather, I was rather academic at a certain point. And then um, I moved my public school in my sixth form to Clifton College in Bristol. And brilliantly, girls had just been introduced into just the sixth form. So a heady combination of the pressure of being sort of pushed towards Oxbridge and girls uh, and sort of weird um, influence from my father was like, oh, I think you should do Oxbridge. And I thought, oh, you're not really in my life. Why am I going to listen to you? And But there are these fantastic girls that we've just been introduced to. So it all sort of slightly fell apart, <laughs> fell apart all the academia there. I thought, oh, I don't want to work that hard anymore. Um, and we had a brilliant theatre and we had a terrific English uh, teacher called Christopher Jeffries, who was actually immortalised uh, by um, Jason Watkins in that brilliant... Uh, film um oh god what was it called because it was based on you know the woman that went disappearing in a bristol flat and he owned the flat and he for a minute was the uh sort of prime suspect and we all knew that it would could never be him um roger michelle directed this brilliant thing Are you looking it yeah, up, looking up yeah. now i'm trying to think what that is it was called lost honor of christopher jeffries there you go oh. lost honor of christopher jeffries. so he was my english teacher and he was eccentric and he did have blue hair and long nails and he was rather fabulous but he was responsible for introducing me certainly into world cinema and french cinema and uh, and we had a brilliant the red grave theater there so that was where i thought you know what i consciously i thought this is the path i'm going to pursue i'm not going to go down the uh oxbridge route although i did have to sort of continue to humor my father so i went to university for a year and then it was there I thought no I really I really don't want to do this I'm going to train um and I applied to all the standard drama schools um and only really got in at one um most of them said you're too young because I my birthday's in September and I always went up a year when I used to be clever um and then um most of them just said I'll go fuck off for a year and then come back and the one that accepted me was um central and then it was undergoing a massive refurbishment and it was a series of port cabins and I don't know who I thought I was, but I was rather grand about oh, I think I'm going to be training in a series of port cabins. <laughs> so, um, so I did, I sort of took their advice and I buggered off for a year and traveled around a bit. And then I came back and I just auditioned to the Bristol Old Vic and to Guildhall because from the first round, those were the schools that I sort of enjoyed the most and liked the, their ethos and their vibe. And they got offered places at both, but because of course I'd been at school at Bristol recently, I thought, oh, I don't want to be want to get into town so I went and trained at, at Guildhall for um for three years at the Barbican and um and had a great time it was um yeah it was it was a it was a lot of fun did your when did your father then start to think oh okay Adam's really like killing it in the acting business was that a long time or was it when you were at drama school oh no I think by that oh, he was living in America at the time his his influence was sort of uh, minimal but it, it, it did struck me that I paid far more heed to it than I needed to 
So um, no, he could, you know, he he was he was more than absent, so he could care less. And actually, I don't think he ever came to see a professional really? gig. It was always a slight thing that uh, uh, I felt that he never really engaged uh, in that part of uh, in my career. But he was, you know, he was sort of an absent figure. Um, uh, and has since passed away. So yeah, that I, there's a small sadness there, I suppose. But no, he was never that engaged with that. I that think a lot of, of actors have this. That their parents might not be that enthusiastic about them. Not 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 just acting, but any sort of risky endeavor, if you if you like. What advice would you give to those people? Because being you know being 18, even up in through your 20s, is quite a hard time to decide what you want to do. And having your parents say no maybe you should become a lawyer or maybe you should become an accountant and have that what? safety net which that's means right. that you're constantly like oh I, ki- I do kind of need to focus on that in the background instead of fully yeah. going for acting what, what would you say to those people to, you know it's really tricky it's really it's a tricky one because my daughter who's about to turn 21 is now making noises that she might want to train and i'm very conscious that the more um uh, I try to put her off it or, or show her some of the realities of the industry, the keen obviously she's going to be. She also, it's also slightly set at the backdrop that she's been at Leeds for the last two years and her whole university year has been scuppered mm-hmm. by COVID and, and all that, all the, the shooters are on strike. So I, I, I'm aware that part of her might be wanting to try and reclaim a student experience through training. But what I w- would say is if somebody is committed on that path um, and what, a, the young generation that I'm working with at the moment seem to be really, really good at in a way that we weren't, mainly, I suppose, because of the advent of social media, but is really, if you're committed to this, also be committed to creating your own work. Be responsible for trying to create your own art rather than just relying on waiting to, to get a job. And almost every example of somebody I've worked with professionally who's done that, from Ricky Gervais to Phoebe Waller-Bridge to Michaela Cole, you know, I mean, those are maybe extreme examples, but they all pursued that uh, agenda rigorously and look how it's it's paid off. So I would say, yeah, I wouldn't, I, I mean, I don't know, I'm not a big advocate for, you know, having a, a backup career because I didn't do that and I've been fortunate enough to work enough, but going into the industry now, I would say that would be a, a crucial thing to, 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 to try and um, create alongside your you pursuing your career as an actor if you were starting out now what kind of thing would you do if you were creating your own work i think if i if i had the benefit of hindsight if i had the benefit of knowing um who i am and how i operate now then i would definitely have got into producing i think earlier i would have i feel like i'm a great curator i sort of know what works and how but i'm not necessarily the best person to create the work to make it actually happen yeah, yeah, I would pull together friends whose writing I really like together with people whose acting are, and try and put them together. There was a moment really early on um, when I was desperate to try and get Nina Rain and Mike Bartlett to write together. And I had this idea of Mike writing all the female parts and Nina to write the male parts. But it was just, it was slightly the wrong timing. They both already started accelerating in their own careers and had endless commissions and, you know, um, so I think that's what I would have chosen to have concentrated on more is, is curating work with the with the people uh, around me and, and produce. Do you have any ideas at the moment of things you'd like to do? There has been an idea that Nina and I spoke about a, a while ago that's still sort of percolating uh, along. I'm always interested in the human condition, really. It's none of the sort of fantasy or the... I'm always drawn to those personal stories about... Um, about ourselves and the foibles of human frailty and the tragedy and comedy in our lives that exists. So it would be in that uh, uh, in that arena somewhere. I think it would be a very um, human uh, story. We did this. She wrote a play called Consent that we thought would be the perfect sort of pilot episode of a group of these friends and how their lives continue to fracture or come together. And we, we hope that that might be the beginning of, you know, a, a series, but it would be in that, it would be in that arena about, yeah, the life and loves that we, we all live through. Sure. You mentioned a little bit before that you wanted to, or you're trying to not, not put off your daughter, but kind of tell her about the realities of the industry. Hmm. What would you say if you were, to, again, talking to these actors out there who want to be actors what would you say those realities are are there myths that you would want to debunk is there 
I don't know, words of It's stages. really hard. I, yeah, I don't know, because they do, like I say, they do seem really, really clued up. I was doing a play in the West End a couple of years ago called Girl from the North Country, and we had this very unique opportunity of um, three of us had all been at Guildhall, and there was one young actress who had graduated like a year ago. Then there was me, who was sort of a jobbing actor, and then there was Shirley Henderson. So they, they had a very broad spectrum of experience with which to speak to the students. We went to Guildhall and we spoke to the whole year and they asked us questions. And it was so interesting that a lot of their questions was stuff that certainly Shirley and I couldn't answer nearly as well as the girl who just graduated the year before. And it was technical things about how best to present a self tape, which of course to somebody like Shirley and I is, is a relatively new thing because we always used to just have meetings in person. So there were small technical uh, things like that that we are not up to speed on in the way that they are. and I. And so I don't feel brilliantly qualified to speak to the next generation of actors because in many ways they feel a lot more up to speed than I ever was at that stage. Um, and the access that they have to information and uh, and stuff like that in a way that we just didn't, you know, mobile phones had barely come out by the time I'd graduated with pages and, you know, we still had letters written from agents in our pigeonhole. So it's... It's a very different landscape now. Um, the only thing I remember uh, is the final year of training at Guildhall hadn't really prepped us brilliantly. I felt it was still a bit too cotton woolly in terms of create, 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 which is great, but also you are then going into an industry and you need to be sort of industry ready and savvy enough. Um, so that would be my uh, only um, concern is these are the agents, these are the casting directors, these are the people that if you're approached by, you should take seriously, because we had none of that kind of preparation. Um, but yeah, no, it seems like a lot of them are so, I'm working with a bunch of young 20, 30 olds now, and they're so clued up uh, on, on the industry and the work, and they take it so seriously in the right way, in a way that we were still like, I, I, I do, I find it ex extraordinary. I'm constantly impressed by that work ethic. And also just their social politics across the board, they are like, boom, up to speed in a way. I always feel like I'm still trying to catch up with the latest language, what we're allowed to say about certain, you know, things. It's, 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 it's interesting. So yeah, I don't feel brilliantly well placed to give them that idea of debunking any kind of myths. I mean, even speaking to my daughter, suggesting that if she is passionate about doing, going to drama school, my instinct is for her to just to do a year, do a master's, do one year, because I always feel that there's a time pressure, particularly for women. You know, she does another three years, she then leaves drama school when she's 25, 26. Um, but I was then speaking to a bunch of uh, act, act, uh, actresses who were saying, no, that's, that's, that doesn't exist in the same way anymore. It doesn't mean you've got a, a small window in which to do a certain level of work or do a bunch of TV bef you know, before it runs out or the parts dry up. Um, the industry is you know, constantly, well, it is in a great state of change at the moment, for the better, of course. So even that was you know, sort of redundant. Uh, Info, although I would like it just to do a year and not do it another <laughs> three years. Um, because also I do think you can get you can get the essential nuggets and tools in a year. And as with anything, you can only ever really implement them properly when once you're once you're working. Do you think you learned more from working than when you did at drama school, or was it just different? Yeah, 100 percent I mean, there were some basic, you know, there were some uh technical uh, things that you, you you learn definitely at drama school, but um, yeah, there's there, there's no substitute like doing work for real. You, you just learn so much more uh, expeditiously, uh, you know, just watching how other people work uh, either technically or or um, how they manage themselves within certain environments. Yeah, it's a, it's a much more, it's a much steeper learning curve once you're once you're out there is there anything specifically recently you've caught yourself like going oh okay like i didn't think about it that way or i just saw something that really changed the way i maybe would do this scene or, or whatever the work that you're doing is or a project is maybe we're having a conversation about this last night i was talking to anna chancellor about this about um the process of acting or rehearsals and i crave being in a room of other actors where you are 
in the company of people who've got real, real experience and you sort of learn by example. And I haven't had that feeling for a long time. The last moment I, I remember, and it was like a really clever technical trick was with um, Tim Pickett-Smith. We were doing King Charles III on Broadway. And the audiences there are uh, a little rowdier, a little more vocal than a British audience. And I remember it used to annoy him slightly. There would be rustling and coughing and eating. And, uh, and he had a series of sort of um, monologues or speeches out to the audience. And I remember one night they were, they were particularly um, disturbed. And he did this speech, but he just brought his volume down incrementally a little bit. And it was extraordinary because you could just feel the whole audience go. Ooh. It was really, and I thought, oh God, that's brilliant and clever and a bit cynical, but uh, in, a, in a trick. But I thought, oh yeah, that's really that's a real clever technical trick. And and watching, you know, somebody's been on stage for many many years, employing a, a really useful technique, and it worked. It really worked. Um, but I, yeah, I'm craving that. I'm craving being in the in the company of people with great skills that you kind of go, oh God, that would be, filming's difficult because it's so technical. Um, um, we were talking last night, we were just saying, why can't we, why are we not seeing enough film and TV where there's overlapping? People naturally overlap. And of course it, in a script, you you know, you say your line, I say, oh, no. and there's a technical consideration as well for recording and editing and stuff like that. But you know, there are times when they're doing a two shot and that's the shot they're gonna use. And you're like, well, if it's a two shot, let's just, because that's more real and yet there are these technicalities that prevent you in some way and when you sort of challenge it and go but but why they go oh well for the sound and the edit and you're going yeah but but why we could still mm. we could it still would do. still make sense to the audience who are watching that because they the do audience. that all the time we're doing it right we're now literally as we're talking doing it right yeah, now <laughs> exactly so there are things like you know th those kind of weird foibles that i have yet to sort of properly address or be an environment where you're like, oh God, we've got proper freedom to do, uh, you know, what we what we want to do. But yes, I'm I'm craving it. It's weird that it's sort of in the ether and that you've asked that question because I am I'm craving it a little bit. And with television, for example, the pro project you're doing now, I assume you don't get a great deal of rehearsal time. No, often not. It's a, it's a real sadness. I think in the old days when the budgets were better, they they afforded you that time. Uh, and it always feels to me like a false economy. It seems it seems like such a good thing to do because you ultimately save yourself an enormous amount of time on day. And you can shoot those things much more comprehensively and with much more detail and much more quickly. I mean, we had the, the luxury of doing it when we did King Charles III on, uh, we did it as a TV film because we'd all live with it for two years on stage and so on. We had that, um, uh, freedom anyway to, to be able to record it but he still uh, Rupert our director still scheduled rehearsal time in before we shot because we were on such a tight um, shooting schedule I think we did it in a month which is sort of unheard of but we could do it in a month because everybody knew what they were doing um, uh, and we had this additional rehearsal time so it's it's a shame it's not uh, factored in more because I think it's always, always beneficial, if only to make the work more specific uh, and detailed. Uh, and then you come to shoot it and that's what the camera has to has to catch. But yes, no, often you you, you have very little rehearsal time. Yeah, you, you have the, the, the time to sort of block it out in the space and then you work that out with the director and then obviously the film crew come in and they look at what you're presenting to them and then they work around that. Um, and if you're lucky, that's what they, you try to do. They work around what you, you have created rather than you being shoehorned into <laughs> a particular camera angle. Or there's not nearly a, the, the same amount of rehearsal as you get, obviously, in a, in a play. Do you find yourself able to say to people, no, it would work better this way? Or if you just gave me this bit of time here, I would be able to do a better job? With film and television, it's really tricky because there's also a, a, a hierarchy as well in which one's allowed to be afforded that, that opportunity um and how you present that um there's a whole range of politics that you have to get through to do that yeah i think you know if there are sort of slightly uh, there are small script tweaks or things that um that's always met certainly on this job with sort of um uh, open arms because i think everybody's trying to work for the the better trying to make the thing uh, better rather than uh pushing perhaps their own agenda i don't know but um 
yeah, it, 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 that varies hugely from from job to job. Uh, and of course, in theatre, the the whole rehearsal room is set up for that environment in a much easier way. Um, with film and TV, there's always a time constraint or pressure or something like that. So, um, but any director and producer worth their salt should be open to that. I, in fact, we were speaking to our costume designer who's Danish, and that is just par for the course, apparently in Denmark when they're doing stuff. They absolutely make it plain that on the set, it, it's almost like a company. So everybody has the right and the freedom to express what they want, um, which is amazing. I can imagine that's also quite time consuming, but um, it can only hopefully make the work better. But yeah, I don't think we have the that culture in the same way in, in our country we're sort of, you know, do as you're told and mm. up on time and just get it right. Um, which is a shame because I think, you know, it can it can often enrich the work. Do you have a preference for theatre or for uh, screen? Um, I, I definitely have a preference for for stage, just because uh, I think I've been very lucky with the theatre work that I've done. I've done a lot of new writing, mm. and that writing has been really really good. And you don't often find that quality of writing uh, in TV and film in the same way, or certainly not at my level of career. I'm sure you know uh, uh, other more successful actor friends of mine get offered, you know, uh, as interesting film work. But typically I, I, I find the most exciting writing has been in theatre. And that whole process, that the amount of time you've got to prepare it, and the fact that it's live, you know, it's great. We forget how important that interaction with an, with an audience is. You know, it's often the, the other character in the room. Um, and every night it's slightly different as a, res, as a result. Um, so yeah, my preference tends to be for tends to be for for theatre, and every now and then you can luck out and do some extraordinary TV. Or the bits of TV that I've done have come from uh, writers who started in theatre, so like Doctor Foster, mm. Life, and stuff like that has all been Mike's stuff. Um, and so of course that that's that's great. That's the 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 beauty of both worlds coming together. But it it doesn't happen often. Do you ever catch an old episode or something that you've done from years ago and you you see it and you don't remember filming it? <laughs> because in everyone's life and, you know, day jobs, people don't remember every bit of work they did, obviously. But it, as an actor, it's filmed, which is really unusual. And then to yes. watch it back and have it recorded. Do you ever think, I do not remember that happening? I haven't had that experience, actually. I suppose they're a bit like photographs, aren't they? I think you could forget it in the time. And then when you're presented with it, it evokes all those memories from that time. So um, no, I'm sh I can definitely look back on production and go, what the fuck was I doing? <laughs> what that? But um, yeah, uh, not, 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 um, not, God, I don't remember that happening. Certainly I wish that hadn't happened, <laughs> but not, um, no, not that I, I don't, I, no, I always, in watching it back, you it takes you back there. It takes you inevitably back to that time and the smells and you go, oh, fucking hell, God, do you remember we were doing this and that? But yeah, no, what often happens is you're, you're mortified at the performance you were giving. Are there any in particular which you go, oh, God, what did I do there? Oh, I'd love to look back at early episodes of me being in the bill or <laughs> casualty or stuff like that. That would be just priceless. It's have a look at that. Keen as mustard, fresh out of drama school doing, you know, oh God. Well, today, Adam, we've got them lined up for you. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Good. Uh, look forward to it. How long was it before your daughter realised what you did and that you were on TV? Was that something you kind of like shielded her from or was it was it just because she grew up with it? She never thought any different? Yeah, it's a funny one. Um, she never really lived with me. I split up with uh, her mother early on, so she would always come and visit. So it was a weird one. There would be sort of a double novelty. But um, I don't know, actually, what... I, I, I don't know what it's been like for her, whether there's been that novelty, or because her mother is also in the industry and her stepfather is as well, whether she's just... It's sort of less impressive in a funny way because it's just part of their lives. Um, yeah, no, I don't. I, I think there was there was only one weird moment I remember she re, re, uh, recollected to me was um, when Dr. Foster was sort of at its height of popularity and there was a particular love scene between me and Saran Jones. And I said that I think got quite weird for her. I don't think she saw the love scene, but she definitely got the sense that other people had and her teeth had. <laughs> and so that, 
that was quite weird. I think first she goes to school and they're like, "Oh, we saw your dad." You know, you're like, "Yeah, okay, I, yeah." He's still so, my dad. Yeah. No kind of thing. Still so. my dad. So yeah. can we just <laughs> move? What's on. the algebra equation? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you have specific like heroes of yours that you would almost like model yourself on or watch and and sort of they would give you inspiration or um, or who you'd want to work with? Yeah. Yeah, they say never meet your heroes, do they? I got the privilege of meeting and working with in a terrible film uh, with Gary Oldman, and he was terrific. He was, Is he this was the, sub, the submarine one. I yeah, the this name was Hunter Killer. Yeah, with Gerard yeah. Butler, and um, yeah, that was wonderful. That was great because obviously I've watched almost everything he's done, and then to be sat opposite him. Um, and it was fantastic. We sat like a couple of old theatre queens, you know, having a good old bitch about the days at the Royal Court. And um, and I knew Alfred Molina very well. Uh, so that was that there was that connection of prick up your ears. And it was lovely. It was lovely that he was still so enthused by theatre, particularly not that he could often afford or have the time to do it. But yeah, to meet one of those kind of um, uh, heroes of mine was 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 great. Um, I did a play in New York briefly and got to know Sam Rockwell a little bit, who I've always loved and think he's just terrific. And again, really accessible, very, very cool. Um, he was doing actually a Mark McDonough play called Behanding in Spokane. And I went round to afterwards to see him. And on our way out of his dressing, we were going down the stairs and he, uh, the, um, Christopher Walken was in the play with him. And um, he was just washing his face in the sink with his trousers and his shirt off. And I just sort of stood there <laughs> and he washed his face and looked at me and went, hi. <laughs> and I was like, Hello. And I felt sad. Because sort of <laughs> he's another great, great, great actor. His, his work speaks for it, you know, volumes. And then there are sort of contemporaries of mine who are far more, Matthew McFadden and I've always held in huge, huge regard. I think he's a phenomenally, uh, brilliant and subtle and uh, wonderful, wonderful actor. Um, there's never bells and whistles with him. He's never doing lots of schmacting. Do you know what I mean? It's always really nuanced and subtle. And I, I think the opportunity he's been afforded in this TV series Succession is just is is wonderful. Um, so yeah, uh, there are there are a, a, a plethora of them that um, you know I look up to and yeah, love watching. And you know that's that can be the wonderful thing about this industry is every now and then you are afford an opportunity to meet and work with them. I've I had the opportunity with Emma Thompson twice and once with Dustin Hoffman. And it's just you, that those are those moments you just sort of sit and watch. And yeah, it's great. Uh, How much um, control do you think you've had, especially in the latter part of your, your career, on what you are doing? Um, is If you specifically want to do something, do you get onto your agent and say, I want you to chase this? Or do you specifically chase it yourself? Or is it just there's so much coming in, you just have to feel the the, the work that you're oh, presenting? Oh, I wish there was so much coming in. God, I, that's the perception. That'd be lovely. No, um, the truth is, the only control any actor really has is to be available and say no. That's it. Those are the only two real control elements you have yes of course i hear about projects and hound my poor long-suffering agent going ah, and they go yes it's fine we've already seen, you know I, I suppose the type of control i try to engender is the relationships with people i've enjoyed working with i feel quite good at deliberately engendering those relationships you know i was fortunate enough to work with mike bartlett on his very first play and the same with nina rain and and uh, a terrific producer called jake lushington and and I'm very conscious at when you meet like-minded people of maintaining those working relationships. And I've been lucky enough that they've forged into genuine and, and long-standing friendships. Um, so yeah, I've been conscious uh, in that sense. And then lucky enough that they think uh, I'm good enough or, or serve their work well enough for them to create more parts for me. Um, but no, I, I don't feel I have an enormous amount of control other than to, you know, say no to things that you don't want to do and then hound my agent on things that I would like to be involved in. Um, yeah, I wish I was at, at that point in your career where you're sort of slightly picking and choosing a bit, but um, alas, I'm not quite there yet. It's a weird time. It, it feels weird because there's, uh, there's a slightly schizophrenic part of my career where randomly I'll get offered without 
any reasoning. So for example, Belgravy, this big new period drama of Julian Furness just got landed on my lap. Lovely, great part. And yet at the same time, I'm still having to, you know, jump through hoops for other, for other parts. Dance, little monkey dance. You're like, oh, okay. um, and as you get older, all of that gets so unseemly, you know, you're like, oh God, how much more dancing do I have to, oh God. Do you have uh, to self-tape at all for anything? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, I mean, I mean, aside from the pandemic, I think that was, you know, all, it was always moving in that way. And I, I feel a bit conflicted about it because it negates the, 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 the choice to, that you have of whether you want to work with them as well. You know, if you're sat in a room with a director and a producer, it should be a two way thing. It's not just, you know, uh, a one way street. You also then get the opportunity to go, how do I feel about working, you know, spending two months with you guys? And and whereas a self-tape, you, you do it and you stick into the ether and who, you know, who, who knows? The only thing I love about the self-tape, and that's maybe just unique to me because I'm such a control freak, is at least you're afforded the time to edit and submit the take that you are absolutely happiest with, rather than the randomness of auditioning in the moment and, you know, what 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 is recorded in that moment is recorded it's not like you can then curate that that's a double-edged sword though because you can spend a long time i don't know whether you ever have but i've spent a long time going oh that's not good enough that's not good enough yeah and then you end up sending your first one anyway i've done exactly. that. exactly well, like, inevitably that does happen yeah. but also there's and it's a tricky one because i feel that's again more time put on to the actor that you're not getting reimbursed for in any way and often you have to invest your best friend or your partner or something like that and it can become like a whole uh, palaver um rather than going and meeting the director or the casting director and, and having a, a conversation there and one little note they could give you could change mm. so uh, it's i think there are there are fewer benefits and bigger losses by not meeting in person and i also think it gives the i don't know i think casting directors can then curate a really good list of maybe 10 people to bring in as opposed to just send you know getting 100 you know 100 tapes and they feel through that. I think in every way it means uh, everything gets sort of diluted in, in, in not a great, in not a great way. You know, originally it was sort of a hangover from America because it was a good way for Americans to see a, a selection of people without having to, you know, come all the way over here. Um, yeah, and the pandemic has obviously given rise to it and validity to it, but I really, I really, really hope it, it, it recedes a little bit, certainly for, you know, for, I don't know. May, maybe it'll be dictated by the, the 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 people who want to do that type of work. Maybe the quality will determine that you actually have to come and meet in person. But I, I, I've only recently went. I had an audition for The Crown recently, and that was in person with the director and the casting director, and it was great. It was such a a, a, a great thing. But we were sort of slightly over celebrating the fact that it was happening, rather than let's just get back to to that, let that be the case. I hope the majority of casting directors feel the same. I think it it can- I mean, they don't want to sit- make their job a bit too easy. easy. I can see what the appeal would be. It means they don't have to orchestrate a studio or time or it can make their life easier. But I think it, 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 it it's lazy at, at the end, I think. You must just get just all the same. Th your, your brain must go into mush after yeah. some point because we were Even talking- Even watching to my own tapes after three of them, I'm like, I can't watch anymore. Yeah. And yeah. The, we were talking to, it was it Caitlin Joseph a long time ago, yeah. and she was talking to us about how she got, for Good Omens, it was like 1,200 submissions or something like that. Well, it was more submissions. More than that. I don't know how many tapes she had, but a, a lot. A load of tapes. And I asked her, do you actually watch all of them? And she said, yes, we watch every single one. And there right. must be a point where they go, I don't care anymore. Yeah, your eyes start I, bleeding. Yeah. You're like, oh. <laughs> well, I had 12 so pages now. for something recently. I'm like, are they really going to watch all 12 pages worth of this video? Or is it the thir first 30 seconds? Yeah, I mean, we all know it's the first thing. Yeah, seconds. That's it. first twenty yeah. seconds. Because initially, it's this; it's just the visuals, and then if that works, then let's see what the schmacting's like, and then you know. What we should so do is right. have a have a, do the first thirty seconds properly, and then after about the 40, 50 second mark, just suddenly go. If you're still watching this, uh, here's what I did today, and just, yeah. <laughs> just do something completely different to it. <laughs> yeah. So, sure. well, it's tempting and it's always the way, isn't there? The ones inevitably you don't feel like you've done properly or you start, like there's the apocryphal tale. A, a very good friend of mine, Dominic West, um, was auditioning for The Wire. And it was, you know, I remember slightly trying to help him when we were up in the attic of his house and 
he was all over the shop and he ended up, we kept corpsing and laughing. He couldn't really do it properly. So he then stuck bits of script all over and he said, I'll just go and I'll try and do it. And yeah, he was in no fit state to do it. And of course this weird tape then <laughs> lands at there and they go, well, let's have a look at this guy. But, you know, I think maybe that's the exception to the rule because he'd had a history of work behind him anyway. And, but yeah, I did something recently. I had to do a self tape for, there's a new Tim Burton project going on. And I sat here with Anna Chancellor and we sort of asked about really and thought, oh, well, I, I, and had that mind thought like, it'll be one of 4 million tapes. So, and lo and behold, you know, apparently they're very keen and let's, you know, keep it, let us know about his availability. And you're like, okay, well. What was the last job you did before you were acting full time? Did you have any part time jobs that you had to work in? I didn't, Ollie. No, I've been very lucky. Yeah, I've been pretty lucky that the work has been consistent enough that I've not had to go off and do anything else actually what's the longest sort of tv job you've had to you've been on like actual shoot the longest would probably be probably would have been band of brothers actually mm -hmm. i guess that was the longest and i only did the first four or five episodes um most people have committed you know nine months to a year of their lives on that mm -hmm. project so that was definitely one of the longest ones um, more recently it may have been i may destroy you but i hadn't been on it consistently it was quite a long shoot that i uh did the very first couple of weeks of and then came back like in september i was like oh, i can't believe you guys have been shooting all this time so that was quite a long one but i hadn't been on it you know did you, did you know that you're gonna be in the end of it or were they still writing as they were going no uh they were tweaking and stuff um but they know the schedule had kept changing for various um reasons and then there were availability issues and i was meant to do a particular type of scene and then they changed the characters in that and so I think that was just, yeah, I think that was all to do with, with scheduling. But the joy of that show was, I remember getting the scripts, reading them and going, this is brilliant. Uh, but also going, there's no way the BBC are gonna do this. There's absolutely no way the BBC are gonna show any of this. And because she'd insisted at having a, a seat at the table and editorial control and producer control and all of that, um, it was one of those rare instances where you read a script and you imagine it and then, the translation onto screen is almost as you've seen it. That it was one of those, um, it's like, you know, reading a book and they turn it into a film and go, no, that's not what it was. This was the opposite of that. It was, it was kind of brilliant that they went as far and did as much as she had written down on the page. It was, that was thrilling. Yeah, it's, a, it's a fairly graphical um, yeah. TV series. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I've been watching it recently and the, the part with the, uh, the kind of gay, Black man, I don't really know how to say it. Yeah, properly, but the gay black man when they go over, it's like a one night stand type thing, and then he gets raped as That's the right. other one leaves. And I remember thinking as I was watching it, like, bloody hell, this is a bit mm. hardcore. Yeah. When the BBC also are the people who commission things like Merlin, which are mm. super soft, mm. and you're just like, oh, whoa, how how did this? Well, I suppose with things like Netflix and Amazon, they have to kind of keep their you have to raise the bar to yeah. keep people watching. Well, not 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 necessarily the quality because the quality is good, but the extent of what they are prepared to show, maybe I don't know. Perhaps do you think yeah. that was something that came across? Uh, yeah, I think it is. I, I and like I said, I you know my cynical instinct about what the BBC would typically want to show. I didn't think a quarter of what she'd written down would ever get shown, and it did. And I don't know how much that was down to her insisting um that she you know was going to be across all of it because originally i think she had a deal with netflix and for quite a substantial amount of money that she was very happy to turn down because they weren't going to give her any sort of creative or editorial control um and if she'd spent you know three to five years of her life creating this and it was so semi-autobiographical um uh, i think that's definitely why it ended up as it did and on bbc one because i think originally it was going to be a bbc two show um, in which case you kind of go, oh, okay, yeah, well, BBC Two could probably got more scope for that. But the fact that it got moved to BBC One and they showed what they showed was great. Testament to the BBC. When the BBC is great, it's great. Um, you know, and I think it's yeah, that's definitely worth the, the license fee alone. It, that that level of creativity uh, is, is, is brilliant. Um, Adam, I wanted to ask you, you, you worked on Extras with Richard yes. Grace all those years ago. And I just wanted to ask, how was that? Like, because Ricky 2007, is... 2007, was it? I'll tell you what, when I was looking through IMDb, I was like, well, man, I didn't realise it was that long ago. 
That was a while ago. It is a long time ago. Yeah. Um, but I, yeah. I wanted to ask, what was that like to work on set? Because Ricky is, from from what I have seen, he is very, very outspoken. He knows what he wants, very much like Michaela Cole. That you know, he will get what he wants on screen. And did you find that there were kind of similarities between the way that him and Michaela Cole worked? How did you find that shooting uh, for extras? <laughs> was it funny on there as well, on set as well? This is what I thought it might be. Having, you know, seen what Ricky was like and I thought, oh, this is going to be a joy. We're going to fall about laughing endlessly. We're going to be corpsing. It's going to be, no. Um, but to qualify it, I think there were a series of very specific issues at play. The majority of the stuff that I was doing with Ricky as his agent was at the very beginning of the whole shoot. And I don't think Ricky had been doing much acting prior to that in terms of other projects. There was an enormous amount of pressure because it was the Christmas special. And so in hindsight, he was already coming onto it with Stephen with quite a, a formidable amount of pressure, it seemed. So there was me, you know, bouncing on a set thinking, oh, this is gonna be a, a terrific, a joy. And, um, this was day one of the whole shoot, I remember, and it was all the stuff that was meant to be in my offices. And the location we had, ironically, was in Slough. <laughs> um, uh, and for whatever reason, we were right in the Heathrow flight path. Wow. So it meant every minute, minute 30, fucking plane would go over, which for sound is a nightmare. And of course, we had quite a lot of dialogue. And, and so what started as a, a minor annoyance uh, by lunchtime had grew into a real, real problem. And Ricky likes to shoot really, really quickly. Um, you know, he likes to be done by three and then we're all off, which is great. But on this particular day, our takes kept getting interrupted. And also he wanted to change bits that I was saying. And so what I anticipated as being sort of a, you know, funny time with Ricky would turn into the most fraught, tense making couple of hours ever. Um, Cause he, being went from being mildly annoyed to properly going and I, this is not to try to uh defame him anyway it's the truth but he did get really really cross and went who the what why the fuck are we shooting in there who's the production how are we met up steven is any of this usable are you, it, all of it suddenly did not become conducive to feeling funny being funny or it just got tighter and tighter and i remember i sort of had this mini little monologue and he kept saying can you change that to there and say this then and now do, now do, let's do it now before the go and you're like ah, ah. <laughs> so i remember when we broke for lunch i was like a bundle of nerves and thought oh this is a nightmare and i also thought typical actor i thought he just hates me i was the only one weirdly who'd been cast off tape he hadn't actually met me um, other than the, when we all got together for the read and I thought, oh, he just doesn't like me. This is his, uh, uh. so I remember going to my trailer and I was literally on the phone, uh, gonna call my agent going, if you get a call saying uh, I'm being fired, don't be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> literally about to dial my agent. And then there was a knock on the door. I was like, hello. And he goes, uh, it's, it's Ricky, can I come in? And I was like, Oh, oh, no. to fire me in person and he came in and he did this sort of he did this very sort of david brentesque thing where he sort of looked at me and then sort of looked to one side a couple of times and it, it, it was maybe three or four seconds it felt like four days of, sight <laughs> of him just standing there going um so look uh the thing is and i was like oh just say it just say it just fire my fucking heart. I, i'm just, he said, I, I just want to, I, I just want to say sorry. I just want to apologize for my behavior back there. I just, there's a lot of pressure. And obviously the sound thing is a nightmare. Stephen assures me that we've got everything that we need. So I just wanted to apologize. And of course then, you know, I completely melted. Oh, it's fine, Ricky. I love you. I love you. <laughs> you know, um, I'll give you a free day. Let's do it. <laughs> I mean, ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous uh, behavior. Oh. Um, and then we did go back after lunch and do some other bits. And then uh, unbelievably, so to answer your former question about, <laughs> have you recorded anything that you don't remember happened? I lied, because this happened. <laughs> and if you look at the DVD extras of, of extras, there's a scene of him and I laughing. <laughs> I'm like, I don't remember that. I've got a guy in just to look like you to do that afterwards. 
Well, Jesus, yeah. So actually, I lied. Yeah, that, that's true. The corpse scene with Ricky Gervais on extras, oh. I don't remember happening, but it's there for all to see. It's in the, it's like in the outtakes. I was like, when did that fucking happen? <laughs> I'll never watch that again oh and think God. of it the same. Oh, God. Oh, it was, it was, and also what was weird is that I then had a few more days on it and um, I knew, I know Ashley Jensen really well and she hadn't yet joined us. And what can happen in that dynamic is you suddenly feel like, you know, other people, really experienced actors would come in, Guy Henry would come in and do a bit and get the same sort of feeling because Ricky was so focused on, on it that you just project all of your fears and think, oh God, he hates me or, or, you know, and there is that weirdness, you know, comedians are a bit weird. So there was a bit of that going on. Um, and I was waiting for Ashley to sort of come to have like a compatriot. Uh, and then it went almost the other way. He was so uh, self-effacing and charming in, in the subsequent days that it, even that got a bit weird. It was like, it's, it's fine, Rick, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's all right. And, you know, you forget because at that time it was really the height, height, height of his popularity and his fame in the office and extras. And so it was, it was a very, very weird, time but um yeah <laughs> yeah that was my that was my experience that has got to be one of the best stories i've <laughs> ever had on this podcast i feel nervous yeah. now listening to oh it. my god you actually broke me for a minute <laughs> I was just listening to oh god oh yeah god, yeah. i'll never forget that knock on the door and his his little face and his sort of shifty eyes i thought oh please just just you know say it Whew, yeah i've got quite hot <laughs> <laughs> Oh God. oh God! Have you ever auditioned for anything for him again, or has he ever asked you back? Or no, no, no. He, no he's no. he's remembered that then. <laughs> I guess he, he must have lodged that thought. That fucking redhead. Yes, <laughs> I've been dealing with him again. Um, yeah, and I'm trying to think. Even if we cross paths again um, through Ashley, no, I, yeah, no, no, no. I haven't. I haven't. Um, I haven't auditioned for him again. I would I, I absolutely work with him in a heartbeat. You know, I think. You know, all his comedy and all his politics, particularly, I'm all over. I'm a ma I'm still a massive, massive fan. But um, yeah, that was a, a wholly unique moment in time. And the irony of being my office being in Slough as well, which, of course, was the setting of the it was sort of like, oh, what's going on? Yeah, that was a that was a hell of a time. I'm going to go to your night shoot later, just like shaking, yeah, having gonna... remembered this uh, <laughs> awful story. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh God. God. Yeah, because the because the clips you do see of them, there's the one with Martin Freeman and him trying to do that one bit, uh, and they just can't get the lines yeah, out at all. It, so you must have, had, yeah, just having that feeling for it, and then suddenly getting that must have been. Yeah. And to be fair, I think there were those moments later in the shoot. It just it was a uniquely uh, tense making time. It was day one. All of the pressure was on. You know, everybody was still sort of finding their feet and. Um, yeah, and that uh, yeah, crazy laugh of his that he's got as well. I do remember, particularly when we went back and they were shooting the sitcom bits, there was lots of corpsing going on there. It was just, yeah, it just, well, it was with me because it's there on the extras, but in fact, if I can remember that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think people don't realise the pressure filmmakers are under, like from outside influences and things like, why does everything take so long? And I'm like, oh, you've got no idea. Just like the conditions. And I mean, you've probably seen on the show that you're on at the moment, like there's probably been things, weather changes maybe or rewrites or whatever it is that you, that needs to happen. Yeah, time, time's the biggest one. The, you know, the amount you've got to shoot within a certain day and all of that, um, which is linked to money. And yeah, it's it, it's very pressurizing. But also uniquely with that one, I, I felt, of course, because he was a bit of a hero, you wanted to be the best you could be. You wanted to sort of impress him or, you know, uh, so a lot of strange dynamics going on. But yeah, there are an inordinate amount of uh, pressures that directors and um, uh, producers are, uh, are under from external forces that you might not often be aware you of. You said at the moment that you were in the middle of a thunderstorm, didn't you say? I did, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, been amazing, yeah, lightning I, th strikes. I think we've heard yeah. it once or twice yeah. uh, through through this, but I was going to say, has that effect, obviously it's affected filming, but have they just rewritten things to be, it's now in a rainstorm, or are they waiting for... No, that? actually today, honestly, today's been the first day. We've actually had a month where it's not rained at all. Uh, so it's kind of been ideal for them. Hellish for us because we're all in these amazing period costumes, which are beautiful, but not conducive to you know 32 degrees of heat. I think when they first started shooting before I joined them, they did have a problem with the weather where it was raining a lot. In fact, there was snow at one point. And of course, it's meant to be the Italian Riviera in high summer. So they then had to rejig that. I think they did a lot of stuff down in the kitchens. They did all the downstairs stuff and um, 
And also I think part of the villa that we're shooting in wasn't ready yet, the upstairs part, they'd done all the kitchen bits. So yeah, they'd had to rejig the, the schedule accordingly. Um, Cause I think our director had a fantasy of trying to shoot it chronologically, which of course is so rare that you'll give it afforded that luxury. Um, so yeah, that all went out, that all went out the window. Have you seen, uh, or have you had moments where your casting type, you realised your casting type has changed and how has it changed over the years? Do you ever get something like, oh, okay, I'm, I'm playing this now or I'm at that sort of transitional phase? Uh, certainly for TV and film, my casting type hasn't changed nearly as much as I would like it to. Okay. I get a full, those opportunities in theatre a lot, lot more. I get to play a broader spectrum of, uh, of characters and emotions there, which is why I'm often drawn to it. TV, I'm still sort of in this, you know, the charming bastard shit bag, uh, which is fine because those parts are often very interesting if they're well written, but there is a danger that you just get pigeonholed. And also, cast and director just go, oh, I've sort of seen him do that, let's... You, so you always want to try and shake it up as much as you can. Um, and I am aware, I am aware of that, but as we said before, I have very little control really in in changing that that much. The only control I have is trying to bring producers and casting directors down to see shows, theatre shows, where uh, you know I'm playing almost the opposite of that. And um, even though I enjoy playing it, because there's a bit of catharsis there, you get to, you know, you're allowed to be a shit. Um, it's not really what interests me the most. I, I'm far more interested in the vulnerabilities of the human condition and, and that kind of stuff. Um, is it a role uh, you'd like to play? That you haven't done yeah i think that there's sort of an amalgam of roles uh that have been presented in in theater i would like to play uh um somebody who's really uh struggling with their own uh sense of identity or their vulnerabilities in a way i'd like to play someone who's not uh as sure-footed or as front-footed as people seem to think that i am i think it would be great to play someone with more frailties and uh and complications um uh, yeah that would interest me uh, uh, far more um there's a great play written by um uh, oh christ i've forgotten his name that was called blood and gifts that we did at the national and i played the sort of alcoholic mi5 spy but it was great because he was so he was so compromised in so many ways um uh, and those kind of things interest me. Sort of the the, the frailties and the vulnerabilities of of people is what I'd like to. J T Rogers. J T Rogers. There you go. Well done. Brilliant. Um, yeah, it was a terrific, terrific piece of work. He went on to write another great play called Oslo. Um, uh, and yeah, and that's why inevitably you sort of get drawn back to theatre. I always used to try as much as I can within my control of doing at least a piece of theatre a year. One because it's a bit like exercising those muscles again. And two, because the writing was there and it was, I also liked weirdly the lifestyle it afforded me because you then have some structure and routine. So throughout the rehearsal period, you're there 10 till six and you go to a place and it's collaborative and it's creative every day. And you know what you're doing for those, that month, those five or six weeks that you're rehearsing. And then it flips and you uh, have the days back to yourself and then you lose your evenings while you're, you're performing and creating that work. But um, yeah, I, I do like that, 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 that structure, not for an enormous amount of time, but um, I think it's very good. And I think live performance is very good. You know, that hearing the audience and uh, feeling how they're responding to the work that you're doing is, um, is very important. I think it keeps you, keeps you sharp. Well, I hope we start to see that to come back in the next- Yeah, let's hope so. And, and months and everything. I'm certainly very excited. I keep hearing people going to musicals mostly at the moment, but you do know, you? Yeah, uh, particularly where I work, I'm right in the middle of um, the West End, and so right. I'm surrounded by yeah, uh, Les Mis and all that kind of thing. And whenever have I you guys to... been to see anything recently? No, have you seen anything? Not yet. Not, not yet. yet. I, I still, I'm still unsure about what's is, are things open. I'm st some this people the say they are. I don't know. Yeah. And. Well, I'm, I know the Almeida's doing stuff, isn't it? The Nationals up and running, mm. but is it all still socially distanced? Yeah. And... Yeah, we had this such weird experience in between the lockdowns. I remember going to see, uh, I remember going to see um, Ray Fiennes do David Hare's monologue. It was about his experience of uh, of getting COVID, and and it was it was really really interesting. And I'd not been to the bridge before, and I wanted to see the space, but of course it was all socially distanced. <laughs> 
The problem was, as is, is, is sort of inevitably, it feels there's part of the British condition um, that I'm not a great rule abider. Uh, some people are and enjoy it and also enjoy enforcing those rules. So when you have somebody like that with somebody like me, it's never going to be great. But um, I remember it was my wife and Nina Rain and we went there and you had to pre-order your snacks and drinks and they brought them to your seats. And then one of the ushers, a very officious usher, came up and went, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, actually, what you need to do is um, it's sipping up. So sorry, what? It's sip and up. So you, you, so you want me to take the mask down, have a sip and then put the mask back up? Yes, sipping up, sipping up. <laughs> um, every fiber of my being, to, you know, I'll sip you up in a minute. I mean, the lunacy of, oh, I know. I know. Of, of it. So I did think Christ until we're back to normal, normal. I, mm. What, what is? It's not worth it. It's just not fun, what? then, is it? It's just not fun. They're just making you a it's not a, You know, the communal experience that we're all meant to be sharing, even socially distanced audiences. And I really want this to come back. I think it's a very important part of our community and it is community coming to communing together to witness this thing live is so important adam very finally we ask each of our guests the same question the closing question is is there a film that you are ashamed you haven't seen oh that's a great question oh Thank my you. god yeah there must be hundreds hold on is there a film i'm ashamed oh, maybe a classic yeah it would be a classic it will be one of those um North by Northwest weirdly comes to mind. I don't know why I good feel one. strongly particularly about that. That's a good one. Good um, one. Giant, maybe, some of the early James Dean stuff. There's a lot of those classics that I absolutely have not, have not been on my radar at all. And I don't know why that is. I don't know if it is just literally an oldy worldy prejudice about cinema then and how relevant is it now and... Um, because there was a time at university and of course at drama school, I just inhaled so much cinema, particularly world cinema and French cinema. I remember going, there's a brilliant little art house cinema called the Metro on Rupert Street and all those videos. Do you remember we used to watch videos, uh, Metro Tartan and Artificial Eye, all those world cinema releases. Couldn't get enough of it, but yeah. What are those classics? I don't think I've even seen um, Citizen, is it Citizen, Citizen King? I think I've even watched that properly all the way through. Yeah, I'm going two weeks time. They've got a print on it, the Prince Charles Cinema. I've seen it before, but mm. I thought I haven't seen it for a long time. So I think I might go and see it at the cinema. But of course now, that'd be wonderful. If there's something like that, you're afforded that opportunity at the NFT or Prince Charles, those kind of retrospectives are, are, are great. It's just finding the time, I guess. Adam James, thank you very much indeed. My pleasure, thanks for having me. enjoyed this week's episode of crossing the line podcast please like subscribe and share see you next time